I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. Okay, Fred Venu, welcome to the podcast. How are you, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Brett. Absolutely, man. Uh, like I said to you a, a minute ago, I've been I'm trying to get around to everybody. All these, you know, wonderful coaches, wonderful stories, um, amazing history. Yeah, you know, you've got so much experience to share, and so yeah, I, I knew I had to get you. It was just a matter of time. So I, I appreciate. Where are you coming from now? So I'm actually um, I'm actually in France in uh, my mum's house. Um, so we've been here for we've been for about we've been here for about two weeks. So that's my my long long holidays after the Olympics. So I came back from the Olympics, uh, pick up my my bag, and with my wife and my daughter, we just uh, came here. Just going back to back home really. Uh, this is where I grew up. Um, you know, I'm 48, 48 years old and. Um, I guess since 97, I never really spent much time uh, back home. I try to come back, but, you know, it's always on a weekend or maybe max a week. But this time, this summer, was, um, for me, it was important to switch off, be with my family, my mum, my brother, uh, my wife, my daughter, and just uh, just enjoy being being back here, really. Yeah. Yeah, you sent me some photos, some, some beautiful landscape back there. Describe to me again where where you're situated in France. So it's a, it's a city called Priva. It's just actually the house of my mom is just just outside the city. Uh, there's about 9,000 um, citizens here. It's a, it's, very, it's a small place. And it's more or less the best way to describe it. It's in between Lyon and Paris. Uh, so it's a really nice place, a beautiful part of France. Um, as I said before, like it's surrounded of, of natural places. I send you some photos, you know, such of mm -hmm. uh, the lakes, the, the the rivers, um, just just here, like go out from the house and you're outside in in the forest. So it's um, it's relaxing, it's uh, fresh, and this is where I, I was born. So uh, you know, being back in uh, this summer, especially this summer, you know, after the Olympics, after the whole uh, COVID thing, it was uh, for me it was uh, very important to come back and and switch off. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I I wanted to be just uh, just back home, really. Well, everybody I've spoken to after the Olympics is the same thing. It's just so, it's been so intense the past 
18 months, especially, and not knowing whether it was going to happen and figuring out how to make it happen and then actually going and, and doing the job. And then, you know, people are tired, people are exhausted. And, and it just seems like a, a great time just to turn off mentally, you know, be with your family, be with your kids. So, um, yeah, good for you for doing that. But thank you for doing this as well and sharing. Um, listen, man, uh, how did they let a Frenchman in charge of the Spanish national team? How did that happen? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, what, what I know is that they don't want me anymore. But anyway, um, just joking. <laughs> I think the um, when uh, the story is, um, you know, a long time ago, I went, uh, I traveled a lot. Uh, I work in, in a lot of places. I work in, in America, in, in South Africa, I work with the Belarusian uh, team. My wife, Alina, she used to swim and she's uh, from Belarus. Uh, obviously, I coach in France. I went to the UK. I spent uh, four years there between um, 2004 and 2008. Uh, I think it was probably the best years of, of my coaching, and perhaps we'll talk about it a bit more in, in yeah. two details. And then after the Beijing Olympics, I came back to France. I came to uh, I came back to um, to a place where I actually started to coach in, in Paris, a club called Racing. Um, it's, now it's a different name, but when I started to, to be a professional coach, uh, after my swimming career and my study and everything, this is where um, where I was. And then coming back after the Olympics was pretty pretty sweet, you know, for me to go back go back to the to the place. Uh, and we have the, um, a, a four year pro project looking into um, into London Olympics. But after two years, the um, uh, the program was shut. So um, this place is um, actually what we call the om multi sport om omni sport uh, club where. You have swimming, but you also have um, judo, uh, fencing, yeah. track and field, uh, triathlon. So it's uh, it's quite a, a big place. And the decision was coming from uh, finance, so they had to shut, you know switch off the, the program, and we had to look for a job. So you know, June 2010, it was just at the minor storm, just before the European in Budapest. I started to look for a job, and I ended up um, in Spain in a, a club cl uh, called Club Natación Sabadell, which is just outside Barcelona. Uh, and and I was there for I was a head coach there for three years from 2010 to the world in 2013 in Barcelona actually, and then I was recruited by the federation. So I, I just moved really. It's just about 15 minutes drive uh, from the club, and I was working in uh, the national center in um, in San Cugat, big place, massive place. Uh, I think there was we have 22 sports, different sports. Beautiful facilities. The Australian were there in 2013 before the, the war as a holding camp. Um, and then, so that was 2013, 2016. And then after the Olympics, I was named the head coach until uh, until now, really. Wow. Uh, I mean, you must speak multiple languages then, obviously, French, English, Spanish, anything else? Yeah, I, well, my Italian is a bit gone because my mom, she's from Italy, so I used to speak uh, very good uh, Italian. And... My family is speaking Russian, which is quite okay now to understand, but I don't speak and I don't write. It's, it's very complicated. Uh, so back home, it's probably funny. You got my wife and my kids speaking Russian, and they talk to me in French, and uh, I got I got the pool speaking Spanish. So, uh, sometimes it's confusing. I, I bet, I bet. But it, it's it's nice to be uh, European and being able to hop around and at least communicate with multiple different people. I guess. Yes, you know, the, the, the funny thing is when I came to Spain in 2010, I didn't speak Spanish, so uh, the club offered me to take uh, classes, and I was like, they don't want to go to school. So what I did was um, taking a one-on-one -on -one class twice a week, right. on a Tuesday and a Thursday, so by December I could start coaching in, in Spanish. And uh, the fact that uh, I speak Spanish did really open me to a lot of people, not just in Spain, but in, uh, in South America, for example. Sure. I'm not going to say that I do understand Portuguese, but a little bit so you can communicate with, with, with Portugal, with Brazil. And right. um, there's so many people in the world speaking Spanish that, that gave me also, you know, like a new sort of uh, commu swimming community, you know, and, and, and talk to people and, and share. And so, yeah, we just, uh, it's just great. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of, of my daughter, for example, she's 11 and she speaks. So she speaks Russian, French, English, wow. Spanish, Catalan, because we live in, in Barcelona. So in Catalonia, you speak Catalan. And she didn't, she doesn't even know that, you know, because she, she was grown yeah. <laughs> in different languages. But I think it's, yeah, probably one of the advice that I could uh, kind of give, give to people is, is learn languages. So important. 
Oh man, listen, it's one of my biggest life regrets, and and I can't I can't blame Australia growing up on an island isolated from the rest of the world. I mean, that was my first original excuse: is like we only speak English here, and that's the that's all we were taught. But uh, you know, it, it really comes down to my laziness as well. It's like you you took a class twice a week and kind of yeah. forced yourself into it, and I think. I just never had that commitment to do it, and I and I really regret it about myself. You know, I think it's I think it's it, it's difficult. You know, especially when 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 time goes. You know, when you're 20, it's possible, and when you're yeah. a teenager, of course, you learn everything. But us now to learn a new language is difficult. But you get you get to do the you get to make the decision. Say this is what I'm going to do. Sure. The best the best way to do it is to go to the country to live. Right. So if you want to, I don't know. Let's say you want to learn French, go to France and spend like a couple of months there. Make sure you don't go with anybody just on your own, so you have no choice. In you, right. you know, you got to practice. Um, but um, I don't know what, what I'm saying that. But I th yeah, I think it's it's. Um, I think yeah, it's I, I went to. I chose to go to Alabama and, and learn a whole new language in <laughs> Alabama. So I, I know how to speak Southern English. <laughs> yeah, what, it's called the the, the red, red, redneck. You call that redneck <laughs> language, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So it's another language. I know that. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, but <laughs> Uh, listen, in terms of your, you know, like you said, your coaching career has been vast. I mean, you, you've and, and your coaching experience, but you've also been around some incredible coaches. How in the beginning did you establish um, your own philosophies and what you believed in and, and what you wanted to ultimately coach over a long period of time? Well, it's a, it's a fantastic question, Brett, and, and um, I just want to take one minute to thank you for for. One to have me now, um, and then second for for what you do on, on your podcast, and and because personally, and it's a li little bit selfish, but since last week when you said, "Oh, Fred, let's, let's try to do a, a a podcast next week," you and me, I've been thinking so much, mm. and I've been I've been going over and over the amount of people that I would like to say thank you. That obviously I'm not going to do a list, no, you know, but. Um, how lucky I have, uh, have been to, to share with the likes of, you know, Bill Sweetnam and the coaches in America when I went there, coaches in Spain on a daily basis, um, yourself. I was thinking about you and and Caesar at the Olympics, how inspiring was the um, the preparation before the final? Because I was looking, you know, you were there. We were, I was with a British team in a different section of the pool. And there's so many things that came, came back to, to my to my head. I was just, yeah. I was going crazy. And I, I was trying to say... Um, you know, try to put some some order in to, to in, in in my mind. But yeah. basically, when it was um, when I was young, you know, I, I knew right away that I was I wasn't a good swimmer, and I knew right away that I wanted to coach. And the reason why I'm a coach is because of the influence of the coaches that I had. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started to swim here in this place, it's a 25 meter pool, four lanes. Uh, there's one side you cannot. I, I don't think now I could do like a flip turn because it's so shallow. But this is where, where we used to train. And my first coach, um, his name is Alain Margier. He came one day to the, to the pool and he gave me a book. And I was like, what is this? And that was my first book about physiology. You know, This is what happens when, when, when you run. This is what happens when you bike. This is the way your heart rate goes and when you breathe. Basic stuff. But that was, and I think I was like 14 or 15. Then I went to university and my, my coach was a, a PhD student. So basically... <laughs> he was testing us all the time, you know, to do his his, uh, his degree, which was quite quite funny. And there's one, one thing that I want to mention. Um, at that time, it was 95, 94, 95, we did um, a form of freestyle for time. And basically at that time, and I I'm, I'm going to try to check if it's still accurate and speak with some of the scientists, but um, you would do a form of freestyle for time. And then the coach will say, we take the first 50 off, the last 50 off, the average of your 300 in the middle, it's your VO2 max. That was that was it. So from there, we would do some math and, and then you you let your, you know, A2, A3, VO2 max, whatever. Um, and that's that's how we, we, we used to train. Um, then I went to Paris. That's That was a bit more serious. Uh, you know, I tried one season to swim as a professional swimmer. So it was, you know, twice a day and trying to look at the diet and do more gym. Uh, I didn't swim faster, but I really did enjoy that um, that season just to, to really understand what, what what it takes, you know, what's what's that, you know, swimming twice twice a day, what it means, why sleeping is so important, why nutrition is so important, why you need to do some core, why, why do you need to stretch, why do you need to go to the physio, et cetera, et cetera. 
And but I was I was coaching in the meantime, so I was doing pretty much everything in the club, um, from learn to swim to pregnant women to masters at night. Uh, I think I did coach everything that you can think about. Um, but I I, I, do, I did realize that you know I had to do something else. So I went to America. I was doing some training camps in the summer. Uh, I mentioned to you last week I was um, the first camp that I did, and that's a true story. I sent about eighty two emails to different camps in America. And I got one answer, um, <laughs> and that answer was from Nick Baker with the Peak Performance Swim Camp. He's still running that camp uh, in in uh, Florida, probably one of the most successful and one of the most interesting swim camp that you can think about. I think myself, and I went to see Nick. So you know, just arrived there in Florida. I think it was. It's a swimming pool close to Fort Lauderdale. It's not the main one, you know, at the Hall of Fame, but it's close by. I, I cannot remember the name. So he went and pick, he did pick me up at the, the airport in Miami. I went to sleep and then six o'clock in the morning, came back. He had a coffee, gave me a coffee. And he said, this is your this is your group. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, that's the group you're going to coach this week. And it was like, I don't know, four, 40, 45 swimmers. My English was the English that you have in school. So it was pretty basic. Everybody was laughing at me. <laughs> but this is how, how I started the, the swim camp in the summer. So instead of having holidays, I would do swim camp in, in America. And then just before the Olympics in 2000, um, I was the assistant, and we had three swimmers uh, qualified there. Uh, Sally Miles, I'm sure you remember that name. Yeah. In the 53, we had a guy from Luxembourg, Luke Decker in the fly, and then um, J.P. Nielsen was swimming from Denmark in the 4x2. So that's the prep that we did. And then I, uh, I just uh, sent a letter back to the club saying I'm not going back after the Olympics. So I was just uh, staying there um, in Florida for a week. Then I did some visit, for, sorry, for a year. And then I, I did some, some visiting. So I uh, spent time with, for example, Paul Bergen in, in, uh, in Portland. Um, and that was from 2000 to almost 2002. So what I wanted to do was to kind of accelerate my, proce my learning process um and and you know uh, I asked myself I said well, what's what you got to do you got to go to where you know the best are and the best in swimming is uh is America so I went there and I tried to see as many coaches as possible I went to as many clinics as possible obviously the, the ASCA clinic I remember some of the talks in 2001 amazing um 2001 after the Olympics correct um I, I can't remember. Mike Bottom, the talk was amazing. Uh, David March, Bill Swindon was, was there talking about, you know, uh, what he was doing and starting to do with the British. I went to Colorado Spring to visit the program there. I had some time with Bill, uh, Bill Boomer um, mm. and Mick Nilsson. So I, I really wanted to see everything as possible. I remember speaking with a coach in Texas. I don't know his name. I, I do apologize. I cannot remember his name. But at that time, the, I was... Um, I think he had the best age group program, let's say 12 to 13 in the States. Uh, and you know, Florida, um, I think Florida, Texas, they do compete quite a lot with California, maybe. And the guy had, um, he had a funny um, program because he had the 25 year pool only, I don't know, two hours per day. What he was doing was doing the, 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 the girls for an hour and then in the water. Right, then right. they would go out and do, for, uh, do a narrow drive and then with the boys, vice versa. And, and his, his land work was on the pool side, on, on, on deck, you know, do, doing some rotation and putting like things on the head and working on the line or whatever they, they used to call it. And it was quite, uh, quite interesting. So in this uh, period, it was just like being a sponge, really, and, and learn as much as possible. Um, went to Florida as well when with, with, with Coach Troy, spent some time there on the pool side. And because really what I wanted, I, I wanted to be one of them, you know. Uh, I, I really wanted to, do, to, to go to the Olympics. I wanted to be successful as a coach. I wasn't successful as an, as an athlete. Um, but I had to learn from, from the best in, in, uh, in the business, really. So that's, that's, that's me with my bags, you know. I came back to France, worked again in the club from 2002, 2004. Uh, when I was 30 at the World Championship, I think I was one of the youngest coaches to, to have a World Champion. Um, and I, I'm not sure about the dates, but I think um, Alina won the tournament freestyle just before, just after uh, Gibson got the, the, the 50 breaststroke and, and, and Gibson was swimming with Ben. Uh, and I think at that time, Ben was the youngest coach to have a world champion, I believe. Um, so that's the story. And then, and then I just went on, um, went to, the, to, the, to, uh, to Scotland in Edinburgh in 2004. So after the Olympics in Athens. 
Um, I was recruited by Bill Sweetnam, which said, Fred, you should go, you should apply for the job. I called Ben. Ben said, Fred, you should apply for the job. I said, I'm, I'm okay in France in my club. I don't want to go to, to the UK. And then um, Ben and Bill gave me very good advice. They said, well, just apply and then, and then go through the process and you see where, where this is going to take you, really. Um, and I did end up going, going to, to Edinburgh. So the, the, the club was called City of Edinburgh Swimming, but it was supported by British Swimming. So one part was supported by uh, Scottish Swimming, one part was supported by, by British Swimming. And then right away, I was working with a group of about, I think it was about 16 swimmers. Um, the first season was difficult, and then we went on, and we were pretty, pretty successful coaching Kirsty Balfour, Bristol Girl, Chris Gilchrist, who was... Um, we went to the Olympics, who was world champion in Breaststroke in 2008, short course. Uh, Gregor Tate, uh, backstroke mm -hmm. slash medley, came up to, to swim with us. Uh, so it was, it was just fantastic, really. And then just, just carry on, you know. Uh, at, that, at that time, you know, I was saying to, to my friend, said, you know, my best friend is, is my bag, my, my luggage. And um, <laughs> I did say, to, to be honest, when, when, we, when we came to Spain, I was pretty lucky to go from the club to the center, which is same area so I did, we didn't have to move uh the, the choice that we made as a family was to stay in the same flat so my daughter could stay in the same city same right. same school uh, and i would do the, the driving it's not much uh but now in uh two weeks we're gonna pack again and we move to canary Islands. so i'm leaving the federation i'm, I'm not gonna work with the, the federation anymore but i'm taking up uh, a club called uh, club natation metropole one of the historical club in in um, in spain and i'm um, going back to club coaching in uh, in about yeah about 10 days wow, wow. The, the canary islands you said yes yes so canary island is closer to africa uh it's quite it's about from barcelona it's about three hours in the, in the plane i believe it's two hours from madrid and you you have all these islands um gran canaria tenerife uh wow. lanzarote it's spanish speaking Yes, yeah, it's it's Spain actually. So okay. it, it's, it's quite interesting what you're saying because the, the feeling is even though we're going to stay in Spain because it is, yeah, yeah. we we do have this feeling that that we go to um to different countries. So it's so exciting, you know. Uh, we're talking with my wife now. I said, oh, we need to sell the car, and what about the bags? Should we just go with the bags? And what about this? It's just like it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's nice. nice. Uh, uh, move is as good as a holiday kind of thing, you know. So it feels like it's a holiday, but uh, that's pretty cool. But, um, yeah, it's you know, it's just uh, it's just the way we we are at the moment, and I, I am really, really um um, I, how can I say that? I, I I think you know when I was on my own, I, it was easy, you know. Uh, yeah, let's go to America for a camp in the summer, six weeks right. with Baker. Take a bag, no problem. Right. I remember. I remember one season, and that's a true story. In I think it was October, I was actually coaching in um, Lake Island, uh, the prep school with uh, with you know um, what's his name, Mike. I think it's called Mike. Um, Mike Curley is the head coach there. He's been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was working with Nick Baker in the camp, and then they gave me a bit of work with the junior there. And I was on the pool side on a Friday, and we had a race. We had a meet, like you know, this dual meet on the on the weekend with Trinity Prep, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I left. Uh, took the took the flight, night flight from uh, from Orlando to Paris, Friday to Saturday. I arrived Saturday morning in in, in Charles de Gaulle at the airport. I just went out so they could stamp and see that my ninety days, you know, uh, visa was was okay. And then I just came straight in. Got back to a plane and I was at the competition on the on the Saturday afternoon and the swimmers were like, "Where are you? Where were you this morning? What happened, coach? And what was wrong?" I was like, "Yeah, no, nothing. Don't worry about it. I just had the morning off." <laughs> but basically, what I did was going back to France to to get a new a new visa for 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 three months and and wow. then go back to America, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> that that was me on my own, you know, with my bag and and, and learning and and trying to you know, uh, as I say, be a sponge. But then later on, I got married and and. I think I could do that. I can do that, and I still can do it now. You know, with my daughter, she's eleven, and and because because I'm 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 with Alina. Alina, she's coming from from swimming. She went to the Olympics four times, and she won so many medals and everything. So she understands. Um, because I'm sure you and me, we we agree on that. You know, it's quite a, a weird life, really, being a swimming coach. Yeah. 
it, it's very strange, especially if you're going to take up different positions like that. You you, you got to move around a lot, you know, and uh, and it's very difficult on family. Um, when I first started coaching, I was given the freedom to kind of create and explore, and and that was loose for me. It was uh, let me let me click back onto that. There we go. Um, yeah, David Marsh gave me this freedom to kind of explore, and and it was free. I felt I felt like there was no pressure as as the young assistant coach and the exploration I was I was able to have. Once I moved into being a head coach, over time, not immediately, but over time, you know, you go through seasons where you, you have good seasons, bad seasons. There, you know, doubt started to creep in a little bit, and and I started to question some of my philosophy. Should I change this? I started seeing what other people were doing. You start to question yourself. You know, you start to tweak things. You start to get away from things, and then, and then you remember, oh yeah, I used to do that, which really worked. And then, and then all of a sudden, you feel yourself a little bit lost. Did you have you ever gone through a period like that? Yes, yes, uh, yes. I think uh, it's it's uh, it's amazing what you're saying because because I, I cannot agree more than you know it's it is difficult. It is difficult. I, I really like when you say, oh, I used to do that, you know, and and then and you ask yourself why I don't do it. Yeah. In, 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 um, so obviously, um, I, I'm pretty sure it does happen to to everybody. And I think in the business of performance swimming, especially, um, it probably does happen more. I'm not saying that you know when 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 you work with younger kids, um, it's it's uh, it's it's different. Um, but I think when you when you when you have younger kids, the focus is not you know winning medals, break record, yeah. improve your time. Yeah, but my time is I don't know. I don't know, two or four in a tunnel butterfly, you know. So, you know, you don't talk about this. You, don't, you talk about the process to get there. But when you are there, it is really difficult. And you have, um, you, you constantly ask yourself, did I, did I make the, the right um, choice? Right. And I think one of the things that um, did strike me a lot when I spoke with Tim Carrison, he was talking about, you know, the experience and intuition. And I said, well, what, what do you, can you explain to me what, what you mean by intuition? He said, "Well, intuition is is the amount of experience that you have that gonna allow you to make to make a decision on the spot, or gonna have, allow you to to reflect and 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 to make up um, a new plan, you know, or, or or to create a new idea, or to create a new concept, or to change or carry on." And I think one of the the thing that I did learn in um, in these years working with top swimmers uh, for me is is you you get a good you got to go to the end of the process. So w when you do define your plan, when you do define your season, whatever you're going to do it, micro, micro cycles, whatever you call it, you know, I think it's important that you stick with the plan because right. if you do change your plan, you're not going to be able to s understand mm -hmm. and assimilate if the success or the failure were because of your plan or because of the change that you made there, there, and there, and you're going to be even more you know right. it's gonna yeah. be, you're gonna be crazy so right. i think that's one of the things that, that i do is is assume your plan assume it until the end and then you're gonna you're gonna do the analysis and you're gonna reflect okay it was it, it didn't work well you're gonna understand why uh, you're gonna address things that you're gonna change that it was amazing we're gonna carry on with the same sort of thinking or we're gonna include the change even though we had success etc 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 um but i think have you, have you involved your athletes in that process as well? Once you go through that process yourself, do you bring your athletes in and say the same thing? Yes, yes. Um, I think I think right at the end of the process, I always say to my swimmer, when 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 the season is over, the, the next season starts. So even though now we are after the Olympics, you know, people need a break and some uh, some are, are swimming already, some are gonna have a three weeks of break, three months, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. I think it's important that they understand that they already start something else, even though you start with holidays or vacation or rest, whatever. So, so that process for a coach is very important to do to, to do that. And you need to find time, time to do that. So at the Olympics, it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to sit down with a swimmer. So, you know, uh, you do that at the, at the dining hall or, or just down the, um, the building on the floor, sitting on the floor in the bus. You need to find time to to do that, and especially in, in Tokyo, it was even more difficult because, you know, we had a bit less freedom than than um, than in the past. But I think that that um, that exercise or that drill to 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 analysis the analysis of what what happened during the season with your athlete is, I think, it's key to 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 
right. for what's coming next. I don't know if I explained myself very yeah. well. No, and also, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and and you know, um, a lot of people say, yeah, you know, don't make the decision on don't when when it's it's you know it's tense, right? Yeah. So of course, at the Olympics, as you know, it's quite uh, it's quite tense. Yeah. Um, but but me me, I like I like I like to optimize those moments where you know the intensity is it's maximum level. So I think uh, in, in, in Rio with Maria when she won the Olympics, obviously, you know, the medals, the, the media, the recovery, etc. But you know, for us it was very important to, to share that 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 moment and to spend time, even though maybe she went to bed half an hour later, which was crazy. I think it was like three in the morning and then she had the heat of the end of the item or the next day. But I think I think you know that that those moments that's it's it's so so tense it's so unique um and it's very rare you know uh that that you really need to to jump into it and and, and learn from that that doesn't mean that you're gonna say just right after the olympics like a medal or gold medal or whatever they say oh next month or september you don't do that but you want to know what what happened you want to know what the what the swimmer feel you want to know how he went i remember in 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 Rio with Maria when she swam, I think she swam 266 in the heat and then 260 in the semi-final. And every single time when she got out of the pool, I didn't even speak. She said, uh, well, I think I went 14.5 uh, in the water. I did uh, this amount of strokes. Um, I, my speed was probably 61.5. And then I started to push a bit. I dropped a stroke on the third 50. I did, 50, I did 12 meters on the water on the last 50 and then, you know, it was like a bloody biomechanic analysis, and she was just, you know, with with so much information. So that you 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 know, as a coach, you need to really really get that and, and keep that forever. Yeah, yeah. What an athlete! Uh, I kind of want to talk about her more. I mean, obviously, you've had incredible success with Maria Belmonte. Um, when did you start coaching her? And and talk to us about when when did the success start to really happen? So Maria, she was uh, she was actually in the club in Sabadell. She was uh, swimming there um, with uh, an Australian coach. She was uh, from the age of seventeen to nineteen. She swam with with the guy. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. No. But basically, what she was doing was um, a reverse cycle um, uh, walk, a lot of speed walk. Right. But um, but she was already world junior champion in the form of freestyle and perhaps the turn of freestyle and she broke the world record short course in the form of medley so she was you know she was already like a very good swimmer right, right. um she was 19 when i came and and you know we've been together for 11 uh, 11 years so i think the um, there's so many things that i could tell tell you um <laughs> Brett, yeah. and maybe you can, you can ask years of history, more there's a lot. question, but, uh, you know, with Mireya, with, uh, we had success at the beginning. So I started in September. Um, I need to say that I remember the first session in the gym, she could not do one pull up. And <laughs> <laughs> just before the, the Olympics in London, she was doing pull up with 10 kg around, around the race. It was, you know, the, the, I think the physical change was probably more radical and she's where she gained a lot more than, than just in the, in the water. But anyway, um, so set, mid September, I arrived in, in the club in Sabadell and at the World Shore course in Dubai in December, she won four medals, three golds and one, uh, one silver. And I think that moment for, for her and for me, uh, to be fair, was like, this is working, you know, this is, it's working. Um, we're just going to carry on and, and, and see how far we can, we can go. What was your philosophy then? So, like, you take her over and you're like, all right, I've got a great athlete. How do you make this athlete better? You talked about this physical change. Was that part of the grand plan? Of like, I've got to get you stronger. You can't do a pull up. First of all, we have to get stronger. Yes, that's right. I think the, you know, the, when when I arrived in club, I, I remember the, um, the assistant coach Eloy is is one of my best friend now. He's uh, he said, yeah, Fred, this is your group. There was like forty swimmers. And I was like, what are you talking about? I, I'm not going to coach for 40 swimmers on my own. So it was quite challenging. Um, but we went down to about 18. Uh, so I had a very good group of, of, of swimmers. I uh, had some swimmers from the what we call here in Spain the 94 generation. Uh, Judith Inacio, Claudia Diasca, really, really good kids. They, they all went to win medals at the European and went, they all went to the Olympics. Um, so the, the quality of the group was amazing. Mm. 
But um, Miria, she's uh, she's still one meter sixty nine seventy. She's size thirty six European shoes. So with a really small feet, really small uh, hands. We always laugh about you know the the small figure that we are. We all have, I think mine is about double size than her. So we always do that. We always compare. We just laugh about it. even now ten years after 11, 11 years after. Um, but we we have to look at how we're going to improve. You know, you, you were a very good junior. Uh, you won some medals, I think, at the European Long Course uh, in Dover in 2008. But we need to to to, to take the next uh, next step. So, uh, as I said before, I think the physical change was probably one of the um, number probably number one explanation. And also the um, the work that we started to do in in altitude, um, we started to plan some altitude camps. And since since then, we I think the least the season where we went the least amount of time in altitude was maybe three camps, so it was always three, four, even up to five camps in in altitude. And Miria is um, she she does respond really really well to to altitude training. Yeah, um, in terms of the training that you do, I understand it's tough. You know, it's it's a, it's hard work. You know, so uh, talk to us about you know just that general philosophy what what are the types of things that you're doing you know maybe even give us a couple of you know sets that sh that she does yeah so you know the thing is Brett for me I was uh, uh, as an athlete I, I was doing a lot of as a teenager I was doing a lot of sports and I always saw the swimmer as a, as an athlete that's that's for me it's number one number one you you have someone who's we swimming obviously uh but we, you have someone that is an athlete so that's the thing that um, I think works quite a lot uh, with, with pretty much every single swimmer that came that came to me. We do a lot of things outside of the water, so right. it is tough. It is demanding because um, the amount of time that you do train obviously is a lot more uh, when you have to run, when you have to go skiing in the winter, when you have to lift, uh, when you have to do some kayaking, when you have to do a lot of things outside of, of the water. Then then your day changes. You know sometimes. They would train for maybe six to seven hours every day, you know, Monday to, to Saturday. Um, so not, I guess, not everybody can can accept that, and not everybody can respond well. Especially if you if you do that with senior swimmer, if you have younger one, and that's why in Spain it was successful because the group that I had, uh, they were all young. Maria was nineteen, and I think she was one of the oldest in the group. You know, the girls were seventeen, sixteen. So when when you start to to, to get these kids. More flexible, stronger. Um, go for a run. Go for a bike. Do a lot of I don't know yoga. Everything that you can think about. Um, work on this um, athleticism <laughs> side. Um, you're gonna gain a lot. You're gonna gain a lot because when you do transfer that in the water, they they go faster. No question about it. And it's not just about speed. It's about endurance, resistance, um, get, getting stronger. You you know. That if you want to get stronger, you need to go to the gym. If if you just stay in the water with your paddles and and your stretch cord or whatever, you're not going to get any strength. So you must go to the you must go to the gym. Um, so so at the end of the day, that's what I said before. You know, it's it, it is demanding. It's a lot of time, but um, it does work. So to talk to to answer your question with Mireya, we went. I think the biggest week that we did was in 2014. We went up to 140 kilometers. Oh. Um, but I think it was more the fault of the swimmer than mine. I didn't really plan that. But I think on the Monday, we did a long, a super long session in the morning. And then when I came back, they asked me, they said, well, maybe we can do again. So I was like, mm, yeah, why not? And then on a Wednesday, usually we take um, the afternoon off. Uh, they say, "Well, why don't we train? We we'll train tonight, and we keep we carry on with with the volume." So the whole the whole group was just like asking for for more and more and more. They really wanted to see if it was possible to swim that much. So we did that. It was only one week, uh, but I guess the the average of Miria at uh, I'm going to tell you the average of the year before London, because for, for Rio, I'm not sure, I think it was 88 kilometers per week average. So we did more, but we did less. And you, usually when we do more, it's when we go to training camp. And that's why I really love to go to altitude camp because um, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe people don't agree on that, but really all you do is sleep, eat, and and, and, and train. Um, and that's why you go there, you know? That's that's exactly why you, why you go there. 
And if the swimmer is ready to do that, if, if he does understand that, uh, you can you can get massive adaptation and massive progression when, when you do these camps. Are you writing the outside the pool work as well? Like the athleticism you talk about, where you talk about running and, and kayaking and doing some other things. Is that is that in a group setting, individual? And are you are you planning that for them? You just say you've got to do this then and you've got to do that, or is it is it up in the air? No, it's not it's not up in the air. It's um it's true that that I still I still um lead and control what we do outside of the of the water. Right. Even though I get people to help me out, so uh, you know, the past two years I was working with uh, one of your uh, our uh, strength and conditioning coach, Oscar, helping. He was helping me more in the sort of CrossFit slash conditioning work. Right. Um, the 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 power and the lifting was more my thing, and um, I'm I'm very lucky because when we go to Sierra Nevada, the the altitude. Um, training center in, in Spain, which by the way is the best training center in the world. I'm not saying that because I work there, but just because it is, you know, German go there, the Japanese, Australia coming. So anyway. Yeah. I think it's pretty um, common that, yeah, it's the best in the world, yeah. Oh yeah, no question, no question. I have so many stories to talk to you about altitude there, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but the one of the reasons why it's, it's such a great place is because you have staff on site. So biomechanic on site uh, you've got fish on site mm. uh, people that come and cook for you they cook fresh food uh, every day morning lunch uh, evening etc etc but we also have uh, strength and conditioning um, on site so the the weight room since it's now 11 years but um, and I used to go there way before that but since I'm with, in, in Spain with, with a strength and conditioning coach there, with, his name is Javier Guayes, we, um, we kind of invented a lot of things, you know, just trying to monitorize everything. So every single machine, imagine a, um, a bench machine, a bench um, press, press um, squat machine, quadriceps machine, you know, the, all the, we call that the yo-yo machines, uh, pool, reverse, anyway. Everything that you can think about in terms of strength, we do um, monitor it. So uh, the swimmer, when they go there, you know, it's like a it's like a small room. They have um, uh, they have a bracelet, mm. so the yeah to, to scan to scan each of the of the of the station, if the, each of the machine. So this is one hundred percent individual work um, based on testing when we arrive at the camp. Obviously, we do the testing when, just before uh, we leave the camp. But we try to be as precise as possible with with each individuality, and it's uh, it's very very interesting. We um, I think we we did a lot of things that not a lot of people do in terms of strength. So again, lucky to have that um, support when we go there. Yeah, you you sent me a, a workout uh, last week of Maria. You said uh, right before I think uh, was it was it in Rio when she won the, the two hundred butterfly. You said she yeah. did a set, and you just knew that she was going to win that race after the set talk to me about that one yes um i was thinking actually i, I think i thought it was 10 days before it, it wasn't um the olympic starting on sunday she won a bronze in the front of medley and that set was the last sort of um fast set on a tuesday night with a suit on so that was suited uh she did three rounds of 450s on a 130 base and followed by three one on the first time and then she has some recovery. Uh, the first people butterfly. So yeah, so we did um, the one of the freestyle. One of 130 was all freestyle, and she was pushing 58, 59, thinking about the 800. Uh, and also, this is this is quite a long story, but this is part of a process that we started long months in advance. But um, the reason why the 50 were fast was because in between. Uh, we did this this one of those sort of not threshold because it was way faster, but we started with a threshold to recover, you know, and swim faster 50. Uh, but obviously, like you know, four days before the Olympics, a, a runner were really, really fast. Um, and back to the 50. So the 50 was uh, the first one from a dive, three from a push, and we did the block one and three uh, butterfly, and the med the medley was on on the second block. Mm. And in Butterfly, she was diving 27.3, 27, I think, 4 on the last block. 
and then pushing 28, 28 a 28 7 28 h he never went 28 low but it was everything was 28 and that was the first time ever that she was pushing 28 in training with a suit on um so yeah i guess you know as a coach four days before going to the to race it's a very good indicator and you know you know she's ready basically I mean, you, you know she's ready physically at that stage. How do you know she's ready mentally? What what is special about Maria that is is unique to her? Well, if I think that's a great question, and again, <laughs> I've been thinking this this past couple, past couple of days about the old, you know, Olympics in, in in Rio. And when I um when I said I said a few times to some of the coaches, I said myself as a coach, it was probably one of the easiest competition ever. And people, some people. You know, ah, this guy, you know, is stuck up or whatever. No, it's, it's not that. It's that she yeah. was in control of everything. Right. Um, you know, making decisions such as on Wednesday, we take the bus, we go to the village, we enter. You know, this moment when you, you enter the Olympic village is right. pretty sweet. So, you know, instead of being like, yeah, I'm going to do some photos for, you know, my Twitter or whatever, she was taking off everything. Uh, WhatsApp, uh, mm -hmm. email message. Instagram, Twitter, so she had no control, no contact with social media right. whatsoever during the entire Olympics. And the only, um, the only we, we, we had um, a sort of code to communicate, um, <clears throat> but the only WhatsApp that she would send was to me because everything else was blocked. Right. And she was only talking to me at, uh, at night after dinner. Just, hey, I'm fine. I'm going to go to bed. See you in the morning. And everything was uh, everything was under control. Everything was planned. You know, we planned um, the timing. You know, I see you at seven twenty-five in the in the lobby of the building. We're gonna go and have breakfast, go back, have a shower. Anyway, everything was so um, so easy with with her that even even sometimes it was like, what's what's happening? You know, it's too um, <laughs> it's too easy. Um, but she she was very dominant and. Um, Obviously, the work that we did with the the mental coach, we call that mental coach. We don't call him um, a, a sports psychologist. Right. Um, also, also was 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 fantastic. So they they together they were just like you know working on this aspect of of being in your own thing. You know, doing what you got to do. Don't worry about the rest. Yes, you've been to the Olympics. Yet you know it is. You met, perhaps you're gonna you know, meet Rafa Nadal and he's going to come and say hello. Perhaps you're going to see Michael Phelps in the bus. All of you was like, you know, all oh, check, check, check. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm, I know why I'm, why I'm here for. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the thing that we, 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 the coaches always say is, you know, when you are in the final at the Olympics, there's eight swimmers, technically probably great, physically super prepared. Everybody has his own strategy, even if it's a, from the 50 to the to the 1500, the 200, medley, whatever, you know, they got a race plan and there's only one uh, who, who get the goal, right? Uh, and probably probably the one who gets the goal is the one most or best prepared mentally. Um, and the year before the Olympics in Rio, what, what we did with Maria, we started to use the word invisible, you know, that's, that's it's a pretty strong word and that's, that's what we started to do in, in practice. And not only that, but we did implement um, pressure sessions. So, uh, you know, it goes, you're on the pool set and pool side and you're, you're training session and then three, four times per week, whatever you do, it's like really intense. You got to go as fast as you can, time, stroke rate, uh, whatever. But um, when do you actually prepare your mind to reproduce what you're going to face uh, when you are at the Olympics? Right. You don't do that a lot, do you? So that's what we did with the mental coach. He was coming on deck and I was doing my job as a coach to put a lot of pressure on, on that, you know, the time and do this and think about you, you're underwater. Come on, last 50, push as 15. Even if you go 16, doesn't matter. Push as hard as you can. Make sure you go 28, 29, blah, blah, blah. Plus the mental coach was on the side and, and doing his work to, to, to apply pressure uh, and to try to reproduce what she's going to face, what she would face later on at the Olympics. Right. I love that too, by the way. Uh, I love all of that. Bruno's going to love this because uh, we did exactly the same thing uh, this year for, for Tokyo. He, he turned off all his social media. The only person that could contact him was me. Uh, sometimes I even had to go through his wife to get to him. Who, his wife was coaching him at the, at the games, but, uh, but he would only talk to me at a certain time once a day. Um, but, but I knew it wasn't a panic. It was planned and it was, it was thought out and it was, it was um it kept him in a state that I've never seen him before, you know, of just complete relaxation where 
none of the outside stuff mattered because honestly, I think in past preparations, some of that stuff has crept in and it's got in the way, you know, and, and in a 50, you can, you can force it because you're a little angry or you're a little, you know, you got a chip on your shoulder or whatever it is. And, and that, that moment of forcing things changes everything completely. So, I mean, he was so relaxed and so controlled and look, we, we got the bronze in the end. It wasn't the gold medal. I don't think anyone was necessarily beating Caleb Dressel at, at that Olympics, unless you're, you're going to break the world record as well. So, uh, yeah. but you know, he, he did it. And uh, you know, everything you just talked about there is was so relatable. And, and I think it's, it's such a lesson to athletes to, to listen to what, you know, how Maria did it with you and how, how Bruno did it with me. And um, it, it's a, a lot of valuable lessons in that, I think. Yeah, I agree, Brett. I think the, uh, in, like now I'm thinking about 20,000 things that you just said, but um, I remember Bill, I, I think it's Bill Sweetnam who, who said to us, he said, you know, uh, when you don't plan, basically you plan to fail, or mm -hmm. so, yeah. like some kind of phrase of, right. of Bill. And, um, and what I can say to you is that um, you win the Olympics way ahead of the Olympics. I don't know if it makes sense what I'm saying, but... Sure. Um, when I when I saw Bruno in Barcelona during the Marine Rostrum, his routine, his body language, mm -hmm. um, the communication with his wife when she was on the pool side, close, you know, close to the guy, far away, watching from there, watching from close, all of this, you know, it makes you think like, you know, this is this this something is going to happen. Yeah, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen, but something is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I remember a long time ago, I'm going back 2003 when. Um, Alexander Popov was in Canet to coming back from Fort de Meur from altitude training actually and doing a dive 25 fly. I think it was, uh, I, I don't know, nine seven. And then speaking to the coach, and then the coach came to me, he was talking, Gennady, we talk about, uh, and he says, Yeah, he's ready. And, and you could see the guy was ready. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with Mireya, the, the set that, that I told, told you on a, on a Tuesday, swimming on the, on the, on the Sunday, um, the set that she did maybe. 10 days before the race that she did three weeks before going 205, um, 200 fly, 435 medley, uh, 1605 in the, in the 1500, 824, 825, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this explain why she, she, she won the Olympics. You don't win the Olympics on the day because you decide, now I'm going to win the Olympics. It just mm. doesn't happen. No. And the last talk that I had with a coach before I left Tokyo, was actually with Coach Troy, and then he was so relaxed. And I said, oh, "I said, you happy?" He said, "Yeah, of course I'm happy." Um, and he told me, he said, "Fred, you remember in 2019 at the World Champs?" I was like, "Yeah, I remember." He said, "What did I tell you? What did I tell you?" He, and I said, uh, "You told me that you know at the Olympics it's going to be amazing because two years ago you started to do this, this, and that." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, you do remember." And I said, "Yeah, of course I remember." And I think. Um, Reflecting on what you said about, about Bruno, uh, the preparation, you know, my experience with Miriam in 2016, what Ben Titley was saying about the success that he had, tremendous success, success with his group. Um, it's, it's, it's one, our responsibility to do that. Um, and, and probably the success of, of Ariane Titmus is probably because with a coach, they started three, four years down the road looking yeah. there, you know, and that's, that's the most difficult thing to do with, with, with a swimmer oh. nowadays. And I, and I remember when Ben was talking about the swimmers, you know, like the younger ones, especially, and some of them told me, said, Fred, you talk about the Olympics in two years and your plan and this and that, but I don't even know what I do next month. So that was quite, you know, it was like shocking to me. It was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of their mind at least. So I need to go back and connect to, to that to explain, you know, how it works. But anyway, long story short, or short story long, I don't know how you say that. Um, how can you convince someone to get involved in something that's going to happen in a long, uh, long ride, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I think the only exception to that maybe recently that I've spoken to is, is Bobby Fink. Bobby, uh, <laughs> Bobby seemed to not really uh, fully understand that he was going to win two gold medals at the Olympics until he just went out and did it. But, I mean, the preparation is there. And, and you said it too. You watched his 1500 and you knew strategy-wise sitting there next to those guys his strategy was to hold and they and he said it on the podcast hold with those guys and then when it came down to the last 50 it's just a race who wants it i mean it, there was no one going to beat him at that stage and so that that's still preparation yeah it is it is and it's do do what you've been doing for a long time in advance right. on the moment it's not for everybody and it's probably the difference that's what ayana was saying you know it's uh i think she says 
this is high performance. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, I would say this is a difference between world class and elite. Uh, it's 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 you know the invisible training and it's it's the capacity that you have to to respond when it matters because a lot of people get get to to a certain level but there is only one champion you know um, mm. and um, I'm pretty sure this guy I I, I don't know uh, I would like to speak with 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 the coach with Anthony Nesti to understand the strategy but um, you could also see some some. Um, Comfort, it, it was comfortable in that race, you know, because I'm sure he knew what, what, what would happen, you know. Yeah. So that means that that if you if you sit on, on 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 the side of two guys, I mean, this is this is Paltineri, this is Florian Wetborg, the best of the best for, for Olympic champion. This this probably takes a lot of work. Um, and I I I, I listen to the podcast, a pretty funny guy. I, I like to meet him, but yeah. sure there's a lot of work from from the coach behind that to, to get a moment and to control that. Uh, because I tell you what, Brett, it's it's uh, it's it's tough. I know. <laughs> I laugh because when I speak with Ben, he said, "Yeah, you can do the fifteen hundred. It's swimming slow, you know." And I do the sprint, it's swimming fast. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, blah blah blah." But it's it's um, mentally, it's so difficult, so difficult. Um, a, a massive, a massive respect for for that strategy. And you know, and you know what I'm thinking now? That does remind me the the relay in two thousand and eight. Um, and I don't want any drama, but <laughs> um, the only thing that I want to share is that actually I was with Ben and we were behind the American team watching the race. Okay, so you know the story. Obviously, uh, Fred was involved in it and right, right. they swim, they swim, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Alan starts and then when about five to seven meters before the turn of Jan Jason Lezak, the entire American team, they were all sitting, nobody was standing up, all sitting there, you know, with the taking the split and looking the race. At one moment, everybody just they just stood up because they knew that something would happen at, at the end of the of, of of the pool. You know, it was fifty five meters left or whatever, fifty seven meters left. But that reaction for me was so impacting. And I said to Ben, I said, "Look, you know," and I said, "Yeah, yeah, it's coming, it's coming." Um, and why it's coming? Because it's planning, and because the strategy was probably for that to happen. And probably they were the only one to believe that could happen. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, I see I that, see myself. that myself. Um, um, Talk to me about COVID, uh, the, the situation there. What did you learn during this period, if, if anything, that um, you know maybe you'll take forward into the future? Um, good question, Brett. I think from a personal aspect, I was expecting that to um, to bring more. Um, ah, I mean, it's going to be my French romantic side, but to bring more love in general, just right. people loving more each other, you know, like in, not necessarily in swimming, but in the street or in, in, in the building. And, you know, and then one day when I saw the, the building next to me, some people writing a letter to, doc, to the doctor, please don't go home because you worked in the hospital and we don't want you here. It was like, you know, bloody human race. It was just, we seem to be more and more stupid, just, just pathetic, really. So that's one of the negative things. Yeah. Um, but in terms of swimming, in terms of, of, of this experience, I think the, I certainly learned to trust more people. Uh, I certainly uh, think we need to give more space for conversation. And, in, you know, I, I remember back in the, in the days, I, I don't consider myself old, I'm, I'm 48, I'm still a young kid, you know, but um, when, when we did not, didn't have the phone, uh, we, we used to stay in a shower for, I don't know, an hour and speak. You know, speak and even sometimes with a coach, just stay there with a coach and talk about the session, and then just talk about life in general. Uh, even in Paris, I remember 2008 after the Olympics, 2009, I was just sitting there with the guys and 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 I think a funny story from Amory Levaux, and then uh, Ben would, would tell a joke, and and then we talk about yeah, what we're we gonna do tomorrow. Hey, coach, what, what's the set now? I'm not gonna say yeah, coach, what's the set? And I, I would say something, and then the next day do something totally different. We had more time together, you know. Yeah. Nowadays, the, the kids they, they 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 do finish the 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 session, they disappear, you know. And, and and the first thing that they do when they go out of the water, they, they go on the phone. And sometimes I tell them, I say, well, what what are you going to do? Are, are you a businessman? You have to you have to worry about something. Or how much email you got in your industry today? They say, no, you you're just here to swim and study. And um, so 
try also to 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 give them time to do that because it's just part of life uh, today. And also, um, for me personally, I went back to 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 one of your questions at the beginning of, of the of the chat um, about this planning. Um, when you when you plan, make sure make sure you assume your plan to the end. And one of the example uh, for me is um, talking to Sean Kelly. We uh, we talk about you know the strain, and then Sean is, is pretty crazy with one thing. Uh, Sometimes when he says I'm gonna do on the first of January one one push up, and then on the second of January I'm gonna do two push ups and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't know which is the day to day, but I'm sure he's he's probably doing close to 200 and whatever push ups every day, and then. Um, I think it was about five years ago, we tried to do that pull-ups and I started to the challenge with, with him and I gave up, it was too, 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 too tough for me. But um, that, that made, made us thinking about adaptation. And so what I did when we got out of the COVID um, was to focus on, on strength. So the plan was to be as strong as possible in six weeks. And we did go, we, we got every single swimmer of the squad to do the best in terms of maximum strength, max in bench, reverse bench, squat, pull-ups, et cetera, et cetera, in six weeks. That was the focus. Um, but if you do that, or in order to do that, you need to you know, do something else in, in the water. So basically what we did in the water was just technique, um, epoxic work, you know, quite a lot of kicking, but the volume was so low to low that, uh, that adaptation. And then when we went back into some more normality, the guy was just like so fit, and they could do it, anything. Um, so that's that, and then and then um, also, you know, what we do, you and me, learn uh, more, go back to meet um, some coaches, learn from people. I've listened to so many coaches from all around the world. Uh, I think I learned probably more um, in this COVID period than than the past. I don't know maybe even 10 years, and then you go back to connect with people, you know, connect again with, with Nick Baker, which, which is amazing to, to be in touch with him again, uh, get some, some, some Zoom meet, meetings with, with the physio and, and see the physio at, interacting with, with the swimmers, delegate more, uh, which is something that we coaches, we don't really like, you know, to hey, take, the, take the swimmers and, and go on and, oh, I'm going to do some, yeah, do whatever you want, you know, you, you're the professional, you know, and, so I think that's that, you know, from one side, um, as a human race, uh, for me, it's been quite a disaster. Um, from a coaching point of view, learn again, reset, um, you know, oh, I used to do that. I'm going to do it and make sure you do it and you stick with it. And also, um, yeah, trust, uh, trust more other people. It's good advice, man. Yeah. But uh, I think there's no chance you go through that period of time and don't learn something. Don't reflect a lot of reflection, you know, and I think, Part of why I've enjoyed this podcast during this period of time is to is to talk and hear other people reflect as well, and then it h- helps me think. And like even listening to you speak there, I'm thinking to myself, "Yeah, I went through those things, I did those things, and this is this is the changes I made." And uh, I, I think you just grow as a person. So definitely, the you know, if we if we can thank you know COVID for anything, I think it's it's that you know um, allowing us to kind of grow and reflect. I agree totally. You know, when I um. Sometimes, not not much, and obviously now a lot less. But sometimes I do some some speeches. You know, people invite me, and I do some sort of talk. And people in Spain they love, obviously, when we talk about Mireya. Mireya, I don't know anyone that that doesn't like Mireya in Spain. You know, she's yes, she's famous, but she's pretty, and she's a, she has a strong personality. Everybody's love her. So sometimes I do speeches, and uh, when I get into the sort of you know, no, like a little bit emotion aspect, you know, we I say. Um, Something with, with something true, you know. I never had the the chance to celebrate the birthday of my daughter. She's eleven. I, I've, I've never done one because I'm always away, mm. most of the time in training camps, sometimes in competition. But I did the eleven years back birthday with with Mireya. So that's one of the part of the talk where people get a little bit tense, you know, when when they say, you know, what it takes to be a to be a, a a top coach or to be you know a senior coach or whatever you, you know talk about sacrifice and making choices and etc right. etc et uh, but um I, I i didn't listen you know when when people would, and, and sean told me i think about last year he told me again he said fred 
take a flight and leave, leave, you know, Sierra Nevada and go to see your daughter and spend two days and we find a solution. We bring someone to cover or the, the swimmer, they come here on their own for a couple of days. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't do it, you know? <laughs> and and because, because again, you know, you don't want to, to, to delegate. You don't want to, to, to you, you, yeah, but tomorrow we're going to do that set and we need to do this pay set and it's so important. I need to be here. And it's like, no, you know, you're not, you know, no one is, um, I don't know the, the word in English, um, but but anyway, you, uh, you you just you just stick with your with your ideas, and some, and sometimes you, you just need to step back a bit. I got the same advice from um, from Richard Quick. You know, you know Richard Quick. I, I got the same advice from him before he passed on. It's like Brett, you know, take time, and, and I didn't. You know, like those. Uh, I regret. I, I remember this conversation distinctly that I had with him. And I remember not fully understanding what he was saying and not fully appreciating what he was saying, hearing what he was saying, not really soaking it in. And just what you said there is like, you know, you missed an opportunity right there to take two days with your daughter, you know? And I think that's something that you regret now. And, and now yeah. it's like, you're looking back. I mean, you're, you're on holiday with them now. So it's like, you, you, you can get that chance, but I think if you had that chance again, you'd take it, you know? And I think that's what we've learned. Uh, I, I agree. One of the talk was uh, very impacting for me was Eddie Rees in 2001. And he was talking about himself, you know, maybe, I don't know, once, twice or three times per week going after the session in the morning, going to play golf. And I, I was just an, I was just an idiot at that time, you know, and I was like, what is this guy talking? He's going to play golf and, you know, that's not professional and mm -hmm. you know, he should be writing session and he should go to the gym with a strength conditioning coach and this and that. But, you know, um, I guess in America, maybe it's a little bit more easier to play golf between sessions. In, in Europe, you know, the life is, life is different. Um, but it was, it was, that was his way of, you know, disconnecting and then coming back stronger at night. And we just seem to be just focused on, 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 on our job all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. And we never disconnect. I don't think it's different in America. I think, I think Eddie was making the choice. And I think he was teaching us something. He was like, hey, we're all busy. I mean, we all have this. Uh, and it's all going all the time. Deet, 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 deet. I mean, you get text message, phone calls, emails. I mean, all sorts of things on this thing now. And I think what Eddie's telling us and what, what um, Richard was telling me is you've got to make time. You just have to. And, and you're a better person. You're a better coach for it. I've learned that myself. I'm much better for it when I do it than when I don't do it. I mean, there's times where you've got to, you've got to do hard work and you've got to make sacrifices. I'm not saying that. I mean, you can't be doing that all the time. But there's also times that come up like that moment you just experienced with your daughter where you're like, you know what, this right now is more important. It's going to be better for everybody. And look, I'm going to come back stronger. So I, I just think that there, there are moments and I think this is a teaching moment for coaches who are listening, you know? Absolutely. You know, I, uh, I think one, one of the things that we coaches don't, don't do well is to say no. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've learned that this, I've learned that this year, this Olympic season, I've learned to, 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 to say no more. Uh, and then coming back, for example, from the Olympics, you know, I got some swimmers swimming in, in the open water circuit. Uh, uh, European Cup is called and the World Cup, um, long distance stuff. And obviously, I'm in contact with them, you know, even though this is holidays. But I said, uh, I'm not going. I said, no, nope, I'm not going. You're on your own. If you want to do that, fine. But that's your call, you know. And I'm sure some of the coaches decided to not go to ISL, for example, because they need to, to disconnect. Yeah. That's why I like this format too, is like you talked about these coaches clinics and coaches conferences you're going to, that, that takes time away from normally when you either have time with your, your team or with your family and, and it's important. But that's why I love this format so much is like you're in France right now, I'm in Delaware in America and we're sitting here having a very personal conversation that now we can share with the whole world, our experiences and they can just click on it, watch it, learn from it, turn it off and walk away. And it, it doesn't take all that time and energy and effort. So I love that aspect of this. Um, so thank you. Uh, one last thing I want to touch on maybe here is, uh, you know, we're three, we're three, three years out from Paris. You, you have a young athlete now who comes to you and says, Hey coach, I want to get on the podium in Paris three years from now. What are the things that you're telling them that are absolutely essential you feel in order for them to have success in in three years at the next Olympics, well, I think I think it's uh, I think it's a good last question and probably a good uh, sort of you know to 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 resume uh, the conversation that we had you and me, Brett. 
Um, I think I think if I do, I do have someone. <laughs> I cannot say the name right now, but I got someone who just yeah. uh, put me under a bit of pressure, saying, "Is the coach that I want for for, for to be successful in Paris?" Mm -hmm. So we're gonna manage that. Um, but I think it's it's long term um, preparation. I think that's that's key to success to understand that when you start, you involve yourself in something for a long time. Don't expect a result uh, overnight. It's just not going to happen. Um, and I have many examples of swimmers having to wait 18 months. Changes, mm -hmm. changes occur. Uh, occur? You say that or happen no. um, over a long period of time. The case of Mireya is very different. She was, you know, quick adaptation, yep. but she was good already. You know, that's that's yep. what I, that's what is very important to understand. Um, and and also, I don't know. How fast you're gonna go at the Olympics in 2024? I have no idea, and honestly, I don't really care. Um, but what I know is that we're gonna we because you need to be involved. Of, of course, we're gonna implement something to be the best at, at that competition. Um, and I think I think that's pretty much it. That's that's what you gotta that's what you gotta do. You know, planning is fairly simple. We already know the dates of the Olympics. We we know what's in between. Today and the Olympics in Paris, we know mm -hmm. where we're going to have to qualify. Perhaps some countries don't know the, the the time that they need to achieve, but the process is fairly. The sorry, the the calendar or, or the sequences that's something fairly um, straightforward. And it's what you're going to do in in in, in between this meet qualification, World Champs, European, and then again, and then six months before, three months before, uh, match Nordstrom. If you want to use that, you know, like a month out, where you're going to do your camp. That's all, all of this that you're going to start working on. Um, and then it's making sure that every single session you made a little progress, you know, to, to get you to the to that moment. Yeah. Consistency over long periods of time. That's it. That's what it is ultimately. And it's buy-in. Yeah. You're talking about buy-in to the plan. Yes. Buying into the plan, buying into, into the coach. You know, this is what Bill always says. The most important is a relation. Uh, you know, your your relation with, with Cesar, my relation with, with Mireya. Uh, the relation of Ben with his swimmer, the relation with of Mel with, with Adam Pitti, that's 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 the key. There's no question about it. You know, um, when this is working, you can pretty much do everything. Yeah, anyway. I agree. I agree. Uh, finish with a Bill story. Give me give me a good Bill Sweetnam story. I have so many stories with with Bill. Uh, Bill is uh, he's such a character. You know, like I think. Um, Everybody that worked with Bill would agree that it's massive pain in the ass. But <laughs> everybody that worked with Bill today would agree that they do miss him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and 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 when I think about Bill, I'm thinking about when I was in in the UK. Um, every single coach under Bill had success at the Olympics. Every single one: Ben Titley, Dave Manuti, Sean Kelly. Um, anyway. All these coaches, um, we, we went on to have to have to have success. So he's um, he's, he's probably one of the best mentor, or if not the best mentor that we could think about. Um, and 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 to go back to the pen in the ass, he, he, he did he did push us hard, really hard. And it's always to get the best of of, of the of the coach. But sometimes it's it's um, it's difficult to take. But then when you go to the Olympics for the first time. You do understand when you go to the Olympics for the second time, you still don't have any success, and you need to wait for the third Olympics to have some success. You do understand that this is this is very difficult, you know. And that's what Ben was saying. He was saying that maybe I don't recommend this job, you know. Like my my experience or my you know my let's say my twenty years, they have been pretty pretty. I cannot recommend that, you know. I cannot recommend a young coach take your bike and go away in Florida and then you see what happened. And when you are 27 years old, you have no money. You need to call your mom. Hey, send me some money and this and that. It's just, it's just, I cannot do that, you know. It's not worth it. But um, on the other side, it's it's a it's a it's a life life a choice lifestyle, you know, that, that you decide. And that's 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 I think for for me, it's very important that we do understand that when the swimmers uh, prepare the Olympics, prepare. To be successful, when Ariane is talking about high performance, when Maria is talking about elite, using this world, we have to do exactly the same. You know, we cannot be in a different, different, not not just up and down or left or right, but we we need to be at, at, at right. exactly the same pace. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, but the good story that we always beat is one day when we. <laughs> 
we were in the competition in Helsinki European Shore Course. And um, when the meet was over, we had a team meeting. And then he said, uh, Ben, Fred, Sean, you guys, we stay here. And we're like, what are you talking about? So basically, we didn't go home. We had to stay for an extra two or three days. Um, and everybody was so upset we couldn't go home. <laughs> but they did organize a clinic. Um, we, had, we had some team building. Um, I remember when, when the first meeting that we had was, was pretty sweet. We went into a room. And then the room was full of uh, paper, and he gave us, uh, you know, he gave us some um, um, some markers, you know. And he says, "Okay, we are in 2000, and I think it was 2006, the Olympics in two years. We're going to design the plan, and we we just started, you know, take a pen and put the dates of the Olympics. And then someone was like, "Oh, I think we should have the trials. I can't remember, 16 weeks before, and then one said, "No, 10 weeks before." And we just like we spent the entire day like, just painting this. This 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 um, this room, you know, it was uh, probably one of the best, one of the best coaching sharing moment from for 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 me, and certainly the coaches that were there uh, would would agree on that. Um, so oh, yeah, uh, awesome. yeah, I do. I sent actually I sent an email to B this morning, and I see I, I told him that I do invite the likes of Michael Ball and, and Chris Nesby that can meet him you know on a weekly basis or or every month have a coffee um because because you learn all the time from the guy all the time yeah i i, I remember a picture of him and mireya in tenerife and i think he sat there with with mireya for about 20 minutes i don't even know what they talk about when, when she came back my impression was she was taller it's just you know do you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like she was just a little bit more excited about about things yeah. you know yeah, and it was a it was a season, that was a season where she actually she was in June. It was just a year before the Olympics. Yeah, uh, but you know whatever he said to Mireya, she was just you know feeling good. Well, I can tell you this: anybody that's wanting to be like you over over a long period of time, um, there are coaches just like you who have success that I know uh, over consistent periods of time frames. You know. And they're, they're all like you. They're inquisitive. They're, they're, they're sponges. They take in things. They, they, they ask questions. They, they talk. They, uh, I, I meet some coaches who, to me, just seem stuck. They, they don't want to hear from anybody on the outside. They don't want to ask questions. They're, it's almost like they know everything or they feel like they know everything and it's, they're, they're offended. You know, you're, you're not like that. You're an open book. It's like, hey, let me in. I'm going to let you in. We'll share. We'll and and that's why you're successful. That's why you're the best of the best. Is you're you're a David Marsh. You're a, you know you're a Ben Titley. You're the same type of people. You know. I think I think the I think the only way for me to learn and to keep learning um, is to give everything that that I know. And again, you know, uh, Bill would say you don't know what you don't know. So uh, if you want to learn more, then you need to be able to. To communicate and and, and the, the, the only way to me is, is to communicate what 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 you have yeah. so this is why ben ben, Titley, ben send me a set next next minute i got a set this is why i say everybody can have my training from for for, for what i did with maria what i did with with you know all the swimming that's wrong with me yeah. at the end of the day you know that's not what's going to make the difference no. but if i want to learn if i want to learn from you i need to have the moment with you and that that explanation about about the planning and, and the preparation of Bruno, that does explain a lot, you know, and 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 that's our responsibility. If you stay home, you don't listen to this postcard, you don't read, yep. you don't travel. You need to travel. And right. the young coaches, they just need to go away. If you stay in the same place for twenty years or thirty years, a part of Eddie Reese, with all my respect, um, you're not going to progress. You got to go. You got to move. Yeah. Well, the one thing Eddie did uh, to his credit was always was always available in the summer to to take teams away, you know, and um, and then he's always at, at these coaching clinics. So yeah, there, there's a there's a way. Look, you can stay in the same program, but you've got to travel, you've got to read, you've got to talk, you've got to. Uh, he was always inviting coaches to come into his program too. That's you know, right. Same, same That's right. Thing, so. Yes. Um, Every time I met with with Eddie, he said, "Fred, anytime you want to come, you can come yeah. and visit." Every time I, I spoke yeah. with Craig, uh, Troy, Fred, anytime yeah. you want to come, you know, just open. And that, I tell you one thing, which also sometimes for me is a little bit frustrating, is I had so many visits from coaches from all over the world, but not, not a lot from, from Spanish coaches. So that's one thing that I'm mm -hmm. trying to push. You know, guys, if you can, go to the Aska Clinic, take a few days, go to Germany to see that coach, go to see Men Marshall for, you know, just a weekend and have a coffee with her, or spend a week there and 
Um, because one of the things also important is that um, a lot of books, a lot of articles, a lot of knowledge, it's in English. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not in French, it's not in Spanish, it's not in Italian. We do have a lot of um, communications, but most of them it's, it's in English. So I think also that's, that's perhaps um, a good way of, of, of making progress, you know, is go in, in America and see what they do. And go in Australia and spend some time and ask Michael Ball, and if you're going to say no, then ask again. If you're going to say no, ask again. You know, I remember a guy, I think he asked me eight times, and then I was like, okay, come, you know. <laughs> well, you know, the best thing now is all they have to do is subscribe to my podcast. <laughs> they get it in 20 different languages. They can hear you speak in uh, Chinese if they like, you know. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're trying to change the game a little bit. We're, we're trying to make it so that people don't have to travel as much, but they still get Fred Renu in depth, you know. I know, I know. And, you know, you can count on me, you know, like every time someone says, can you want, do you want to speak to a clinic? I'm like, yes. Yep. Yep. Back in the days, we used to get more, some a bit of money, you know, but now it's, it's just different. Um, but saying that, Brett, when you go to a clinic and the after talk, beer or coffee or yeah. breakfast, yeah. I do miss that, to be honest. Yeah. I do yeah. miss that. Yeah, that, that personal connection for sure. I was actually having a conversation with my boss today, David Arluck, and we were talking about this this whole situation. You know, COVID has, has stopped us from really connecting as coaches in that respect together like that. But uh, at least this is kind of a bridge right now. So. Oh, it is. It is, no doubt. But for example, you, I remember you back in... Budapest, you were on the poolside, busy, you know, hey, hey, it was just like, hello and nothing else. You know, maybe if we meet in the clinic, we can, we can, yeah. hey, remember the LSS when it was hello, hello, yes, and you were coaching the girl from France and what was all about and talk to me about this and that and give me a, an idea. And, uh, and that's one of the things that, that, that I do as a coach. When I go to a competition, especially if it's broad, I make myself the, the I, I do the effort to go and ask questions. Right. You, Absolutely. Yeah, well, anyway. I want to make the effort to come and have uh, a baguette and a croissant with you, man. <laughs> oh, I miss France. I want to get out there. But uh, especially, well, maybe even some tapas in uh, in Spain. Yes, uh, anytime you want. Food in Europe. Oh, my God, I miss the food in Europe. So, uh, hey, listen, this has been awesome, man. Thank you for doing this, um, especially during your break. Go and enjoy your family for the rest of the night. And um, I appreciate it very much. Thanks for your break. Keep in touch. Yep, thanks, Fred. Take care.